What did you learn was wrong with you? A lot of microclots. Congestive heart failure. Doctors are seeing a wide range of debilitating after effects from COVID, COVID vaccines, or both. So I treated him and his symptoms significantly improved. This week, an investigation that may impact millions of people as science and medicine play catch up to the pandemic. The October 7th Hamas terrorist attack on Israel was cruel and calculated. The timing of this for me is absolutely no, ac no accident. This week, starting a war to derail a peace effort between Israel and key Arab nations. One state is poised to both convict and elect former President Trump. Georgia is a must-win state. We look at the unusual place and politics of the Republican Party in Georgia. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. Today we begin with a critically important investigation that stands to impact millions. Only now are scientists starting to unravel some of the most confounding mysteries surrounding the many illnesses that can linger similarly after both COVID and COVID vaccines, or suddenly sometimes emerge months or years later. Many physicians are left in the dark without effective treatment guidance from public health experts. But we found one doctor turned medical detective whose findings are viewed as so groundbreaking, his help is sought after from doctors and patients across the U.S. and beyond. That's wrong. Down right there. Let me take a look at your eye. <laughs> if there's a singular person that first set the gears turning for Dr. Jordan Vaughn, it's Vandiver Chaplin. Big deep breath out. It was December 2020, shortly after his COVID vaccines. What were you feeling? Uh, I just felt terrible, you know, a dizzy, uh, lethargic, all those kind of things. And I was having some optical issues, too. I, my, my vision would just go blurry suddenly. And then maybe a minute or two later, it would clear up. You're kind of patient zero for Dr. Vaughn. Well, that's what he told me. All I did was go get my vaccines and react to it. So I didn't necessarily do anything special. But... Um, except maybe I feel like a meteor coming from space that I dropped down near Dr. Vaughn. Dr. Vaughn is an internal medicine specialist and CEO of MedHealth Clinics in Alabama. He ran some scans and other tests on Vandiver, his longtime patient, but didn't find anything abnormal. And at that time, I did some blood work, found that he had abnormal clotting issues. He was significantly short of breath. The abnormal blood clotting issues were there all along, says Vaughn, just hidden from view. As I understand it, I was making lots of blood clots, but they were so tiny you couldn't detect them. So I treated him as if he had something that I wasn't able to totally see, which would be smaller vascular issues, and his symptoms significantly improved. So that really pushed me off on a really a kind of a a journey to say, what is going on here? There's got to be something there. Dr. Vaughn was on to something. By the time we visited his Birmingham practice, he and his team had treated more than 1,100 patients from athletes in their teens to people pushing age 90. We asked a few to speak with us. Yeah, Andy Sink, 55, had a, acute COVID that required hospitalization. Phil Williams, 58, he's treating my wife for blood clotting. I have congestive heart failure as a result of it. I had GI symptoms and heart issues. Many blood clots in my lungs. They report a wide range of debilitating after effects from COVID, COVID vaccines, or both. Some became sick right away. Others were hit hard a year or even two years later. Hannah Bouchois, I'm 39, and I had um, shortness of breath from COVID. Dr. Greg Bourgeois and his wife Hannah, parents to five children, were vaccinated and got COVID. She became so sick she was nearly bedridden for two years. I felt like I, my body was just shutting down on me and there wasn't anything I could do about it. After a consult with the famed Mayo Clinic brought no improvement, Greg Bourgeois, a dermatologist who attended medical school with Dr. Vaughn, heard about what Vaughn was doing and sought him out to treat his wife. What did you learn was wrong with you? And in layman's terms, if you can kind of explain it to people who don't know about all the intricacies. 
So I learned that there were a lot of microclots kind of throughout my body that was just causing oxygen not to be able to get around very well. He was the first doctor that when I went to see him, he would finish my sentences for how I was feeling. That was so, I mean, I think I started crying the first time because that was so new and he understood and he, and he said, you know, it all makes sense. What is the treatment he gave you and how do you feel today? So he put me on the triple anticoagulant therapy and within a couple of days, I started to notice some difference, but within two weeks, I, I felt like I had risen from the dead. I mean, I, I got my voice back, I could walk, I could do things. And then to see the turnaround, it was pretty dramatic in a way that I personally have not gotten to witness a lot of in my career. Another physician who sought Dr. Vaughn's help is 88-year-old Donald Carmichael, a retired vascular surgeon and former professor of surgery at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He and his wife, Mary Alice, both vaccinated and boosted, say they got COVID more than once. The last time, a near killer for him. Thought he was not going to live through the night. Our son, who is a friend of Dr. Jordan Vaughn, said, we're not taking you anywhere else except to him in the morning. His treatment put him back in basically in full health, and he was so giddy I thought he had lost his mind. There are also young athletes. The case of 15-year-old Braden Little baffled doctors for two years. He's seen here suddenly collapsing on the court after COVID. After seeing Dr. Vaughn, he's so vastly improved He's back on the road playing again. 19-year-old runner Ellen Redinger is hoping for a similar recovery. She's also a patient of Dr. Vaughn's after getting vaccinated, getting COVID, and getting very sick. I mean, I can pinpoint the day, the time, where I was. When I, I was running, I was doing a workout, and all of a sudden, I cannot feel my legs. I cannot feel, I mean, my heart rate is going 200. I can't do it. I call my dad. I'm like, I'm done working out. I can't, I can't do it. And I went for like three, four months of just feeling awful. You had to give up running, obviously, for a right. period of time. And I mean, I, ha I can't do any type of working out. I can go on a walk, but it has to be like a small, short walk um, for a short period of time. And if I do ever do it, I feel all I can do the next day is lay down. So. Together, Vaughn and his small team are unraveling some of the emerging mysteries that, for whatever reason, have become taboo to discuss in some practices, especially when it crosses into vaccine adverse events. I always say it's almost like there's two worlds. There's before COVID and after COVID. And a lot of doctors are still living in the before COVID world where everything's in the textbook. But when you have a syndrome that, that comes before you and it happens to be associated with this new pathogen that everyone seems to have been in contact with, you've got to kind of open, open your eyes, open your ears, and also get into the literature and try to figure out what the heck's going on. People would come to me. Vaughn thinks he's figured out why people who've had both COVID and COVID vaccines often seem to get the sickest. And it has to do with what's seen in these immunofluorescent images, something called fibrin. So we are designed all to make fibrin. Fibrin's one of the first kind of response mechanisms. Forms a clot if you're injured or yeah, something? Yeah, it's like a, yeah, trauma, uh, infection, all those kind of things. You're going to make fibrin in, as a response to that. But the fibrin you usually make is, again, like spaghetti that just came out of the colander. But the fibrin that you make in response to the spike protein that's associated with COVID and the vaccine is kind of like burnt spaghetti with cheese in it that you have to get a Brillo pad and get it off the bottom of a, of a casserole dish with. And in that sense, that's why it's so unique. It's resistant to being broken down. Literally everyone, when they have the spike protein exposure from either the vaccine or from the infection, you're gonna make some of these amyloid fibrin. The question is who can get rid of them? And if you can't get rid of them, they sludge up the small vessels and inhibit the delivery of substrates. And those are things like red blood cells, which carry oxygen. And so in that case, if you can't get oxygen to tissues, you're gonna have significant dysfunction at every level. Again, what we Dr. Vaughn is drawing from emerging research, and some of the research is confirming his own conclusions. Yale researchers recently reported persistent symptoms after vaccination, long vax, are similar to those reported with long COVID. Science Magazine writes, 
rare link between coronavirus vaccines and long COVID-like illness starts to gain acceptance. According to CDC, COVID vaccines instruct the patient cells to make the same spike protein that's in COVID. This small RNA sequence, when injected into the muscle, initiates the production of spike proteins. The spike proteins, some scientists now say, are apparently causing damage through microclots months or years later. Back in December of 2020, a chilling foreshadowing from a Harvard-affiliated pediatric specialist. In a letter to the FDA just before the first vaccines hit the market, Dr. Patrick Whelan wrote, It appears that the viral spike protein created after COVID vaccines is also one of the key agents causing the damage to distant organs. He called for more research and warned it would be vastly worse if hundreds of millions of people were to suffer long-lasting or even permanent damage to their brain or heart microvasculature, small vessels, as an unintended effect of vaccines. And I think the silver lining of this is we're going to really start to understand what is happening there at the tissue level. You're basically not getting oxygen out to the tissues. Those tissues can be anything from your brain to your vision to your ability to take a big deep breath all the way down to whether you can run or, or do other things. And the problem is, is when something affects every system, it's, not, <laughs> it's a little different to address it. And it takes kind of somebody who's, who can put the pieces of the puzzle together. Today, Vaughn and his team are fielding requests for help from as far away as Germany, conducting original research and sharing what they're learning. I speak to groups of a couple hundred physicians uh, every couple, every month or so. Uh, I have uh, even round tables at night on Zoom with a bunch of physicians that are interested in what we're doing. Um, a lot of people that really care about their patients have realized uh, whatever they're doing is not working and we've got to figure out a way to help them. Today, Vaughn and his team are fielding requests for help from as far away as Germany, conducting original research and sharing what they're learning. Ahead on Full Measure, how peace talks in the Mideast may have helped trigger war. The Islamic extremist Hamas attack on Israel took place at a pivotal moment. The Jewish state was forging unprecedented ties with Saudi Arabia, which has never had official diplomatic relations with Israel. John Hanna explains why this dynamic is so crucial. He's a former national security advisor who's worked for both Democrat and Republican administrations. Was one reason behind the timing of the Hamas attack the idea that Israel was seemed to be forging a closer relationship to Saudi Arabia, threat putting a threat to maybe the idea that Israel was al alone and sort of isolated in the Mideast? Oh, I think no question that for Iran and all of its allies in the rejectionist camp, the thought of having the world's only Jewish state forging an open relationship of peace with the world's most influential Arab and Muslim state, that is, would have been a dagger at the heart of their entire raison d'etre for that regime in Tehran. It would have completely undermined the legitimacy of their ideology, which stands at the core of the revolution to destroy the state of Israel, eliminate the Zionist entity. So the timing of this for me is absolutely no, ac no accident. The hope of derailing and disrupting that peace train that only a month ago the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia said is moving closer and closer every day. That really set off the alarm bells in Tehran and Beirut and all of those terrorist proxies that the Iranians uh, control. Did Hamas indeed derail the progress between Israel and Saudi Arabia? We'll see. In part, that depends on us and how this war plays, plays out. They've hit the pause button in the Arab world because, like everyone else, I think on October the 7th, the earth moved under their, their feet. We are in a new day in the Middle East in which Israel, Israeli and American deterrence has been laid low. Iran and its proxies look ascendant, and they look like they have the power to, to reach out and touch and harm even their most powerful 
uh, adversary in the region, the state of Israel. You can only imagine what the, the weaker states in the Gulf, the Saudis, Emiratis, and others, must be thinking what the Iranians would be capable of doing to them. But I can assure you that behind the scenes, these Arab leaders are hoping that Israel and the Israeli Defense Forces finish this job as completely and quickly as possible and deliver a major body blow to Iran and the, the so-called axis of resistance around the Middle East. Do you have any doubt that Israel ends up surviving and winning? I have no, I have no doubt that Israel is going to survive and, 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 and continue to thrive for another 75 years. I feel confident about that. It's absolutely crucial for all of us that Israel win this fight. And Israel's not looking to anybody else to win this fight against Iran and this genocidal terrorist group. It only asks for American material support and for American diplomatic cover to give their boys and girls the time and space they need to get this job done once and for all instead of just simply returning to a status quo before October the 7th that has played out for the last 20 years, that has only led now to five wars, each one more deadly and worse than the, the one before it. Uh, allowing that to happen would be a very bad ending to this war, not only for Israel, but for the United States and all freedom-loving friends around the world. The Biden administration says Saudi Arabia has offered assurances that it's still interested in normalizing relations with Israel, but after the war in Gaza ends. Coming up, a look at how Georgia is dealing with the dilemma of Trump. Nowhere is the controversy over the 2020 election hotter than in Georgia. Multiple voting irregularities stoked accusations from Trump's side that the election was stolen. Democrat prosecutors are pursuing criminal charges accusing Trump of illegally trying to overturn the results. Today, national polls show Trump is far and away the Republican frontrunner. Now the Republican Party in Georgia is trying to present a united front heading into 2024. Scott Thuman reports from Atlanta. At the next election, this southern state, until recently a Republican stronghold, could determine the entire country's direction. Our path to the White House runs through Georgia. A Republican, to get elected president, Georgia is a must-win state. You look at the map, a Republican can't get to 270 without Georgia. Josh McCoon has one of the yeah. tougher jobs in politics as the new chairman of the Georgia GOP. He is trying to move his state more firmly into Republican hands. CBS News projects Joe Biden has won Georgia, flipping the traditional red state blue. When Joe Biden won here in 2020, he became the first Democrat presidential candidate to do so in 28 years. And the left didn't just carry the White House. Two first-time politicians, John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock, both Democrats, beat two incumbent Republicans in the U.S. Senate in a rare double runoff. 2020 left deep divisions among Republicans here. Biden won by less than 12,000 votes, a razor-thin margin of just 0.2 percent. And Trump's campaign pointed to scores of irregularities. Most turned out to be false, but a handful were real. There were tabulation errors originally favoring Biden, and counting was paused because of a pipe break, only to be quickly resumed after Republican election observers left the room. But the state's Republican governor and secretary of state who ran the election repeatedly defended its integrity against Trump's attacks. What about um, the biggest X factor perhaps in all of this? being former President Trump. Does he help you or hurt you these days? Look, I think there are a lot of people that I've seen get involved in the Georgia Republican Party because of their excitement around the Trump administration, the president's policies, the America First agenda. And I think that the key in the general election is while keeping our base motivated and out to the polls, 
that we do keep a focus on the Biden administration's failures and how a Republican president, whoever that is, is going to put America in a position to lead the world again. Though Atlanta's suburbs have become less Republican, the Democrats face challenges here, too. I am not the regular representative at the Capitol. I've, Case I've in walked. point, State Representative Misha Maynard, elected on the Democrats' ticket three years ago. She recently made the bold move to switch to the Republican Party. What is it about the Democratic Party that you think has changed so dramatically that it just was no longer home for you? Think about what the Democrats are promoting. Right now, they are promoting, we need to get this anti-Semitism law passed. I am supporting all ethnic and religious groups, but that is their priority. The other priority, transgender rights. I support everybody, but that is their priority. Maynard says her focus, now as a Republican, will remain education. One of the things I'm most proud of in this short tenure I've had as Republican Party chairman is to convince Representative Misha Maynard to switch parties, become the first black female Republican in the history of the Georgia General Assembly. While McCoon sees Maynard's switch as a win for the party, it is contrasted by some looming concerns. And a Fulton County grand jury has voted to indict Donald Trump. Former President Donald J. Trump has been criminally indicted. 19 defendants in Trump's circle, headlined by Trump himself, were indicted in August for allegedly scheming to overturn his 2020 loss there. McCoon admits his party is spending an inordinate amount of time, energy, and money to defend members fighting to now stay out of jail. He hopes that 2020 was the party's low point in the Peach State, reminding Republicans to stick to core conservative issues like the economy. I would just ask people to ask themselves, uh, between 2017, 2021, how was the economy doing? What was your you know, personal feeling of public safety like? It's the age old question, do you feel better off today than you did before Joe Biden was elected? Everyone I ask that question to, is it's a resounding answer. The answer is no. But aware the days when an R next to the name on the ballot would guarantee a Republican win are long gone. For Full Measure, I'm Scott Thuman in Georgia. After a break, we'll take a look at what's ahead next week on Full Measure. Coming up next week on Full Measure, we investigate the forces working to shape our information landscape when it comes to transgender policies. This is more of a top-down dynamic that is at play, where you have really just a handful of organizations and LGBT advocacy organizations that are driving the agenda. A look at some of the surprising interests behind the well-funded transgender lobby next week on Full Measure. Until next time, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. Thanks for watching. I'm Cheryl Atkinson.